pretense. Again, number four, false pretense. There are six elements. The definition is the use of fraud to gain title to the property of another. The key is to look for possession and title to property. Okay, what you want to look for is when they take possession and title to another's property. So let me give you the six elements. Number one, there is a false representation. Number two, it is a false representation of a present or material fact. Number three, that causes the victim to pass title to, of, to his property. Number four, to the defendant. Number five, defendant must know that the representation is false. And number six, the defendant intends to defraud the victim. Let me go over those once again for you. False pretense. It has six elements and its definition is the use of fraud to gain title to the property of another. The six elements are number one, a false representation of a present or past material fact. It causes the victim to pass title to his property, to the defendant. Number five is the defendant knows the representation is false. And number six, the defendant intends to defraud the victim. So generally where you're going to see this is you're going to see what, how does title pass? Title passes with money, with in credit card fraud, confidence type schemes, mail fraud, and securities fraud. So those are the types of things that you're going to see um, false pretense, okay? Moving on to the next one, we've got robbery. Robbery has eight elements, and basically robbery is all of the elements of larceny plus two added elements. The definition for robbery is the trespassory taking the personal property of another with intent to permanently deprive taken by force, violence, or intimidation. Again, the trespassory taking the personal property of another with intent to permanently deprive taken by force, violence, or intimidation. So number one is the trespassory, again, without the permission of the owner. Number two, the taking, which is assertion of control. Number three, the carrying away, remember, a slight movement with intent is enough. And number four, the personal property, remember, it has to be tangible personal property of another. Number six, with intent to steal. Number seven, taken by force, violence, or intimidation. And number eight, from the person or in their presence, okay? So look for the added use of force and violence to find the robbery. The purse snatcher is the classic example. If someone runs up and they snatch someone's purse and they run really quickly and the person barely even knows what happened, that's a larceny. That's the taking the personal property of another with intent to steal. If they come up and they snatch the person's purse and the person has it strapped around them and they struggle, there's some type of struggle and the person has, the, the, th the thief has to force it away from them and tries to st intimidate them into giving in them their purse, then that is a robbery. So you have to look at those degrees. If we see some type of struggle, some type of force going on, then you're going to find it to be a robbery. So make sure you point those out, that there was some type of force, that it was taken from the person of another. Another example of a larceny, um, let's say someone comes up and they, they're a pickpocket and they're really good at it. They just come up, they quickly stick their hand into someone's pocket and take their wallet and walk away. There was no struggle. The victim didn't even know what was going on. That would be a larceny. Same situation, um, thief sticks his hand in his pocket, the victim realizes that someone's hands in his pocket, grabs their hand, and then some type of struggle ensues. Once you see some type of struggle, some type of force, then you're going to discuss the robbery, okay? So um, the next area that we're going to look at is embezzlement. Number six is embezzlement. There are four elements for embezzlement. The definition of embezzlement is the intentional misuse or conversion of property entrusted to another who is in lawful possession. Once again, a definition for embezzlement, four elements. It says 
and intentional misuse or conversion of property entrusted to another who is in lawful possession. So let's go over those four elements. They are number one, intentional misuse or conversion. Number two is of property. Number three, entrusted. And number four is to another person. Let's talk a little bit about employee theft versus embezzlement. When employee, a general lower echelon employee steals something from a company, it's generally a larceny because they are not have been they haven't been entrusted with actual lawful possession of the property. However, embezzlement usually what you'll see is you'll see somebody who is higher up, someone in management who's generally has possession of something that the uh, corporation owns and he then embezzles it. What you want to look for is low level employees that have mere custody of property, and that's usually a larceny. Whereas Upper echelon employees generally have lawful possession of their employer's property, and that is usually embezzlement. So you're going to look to the level of the employee, um, where they stand as far as um, the level of their hierarchy in the company. If it's someone, if it's a custodian, it's going to be a larceny. If it's someone who is upper up in upper management, it's going to be an embezzlement. So I want you to look for trust or fiduciary relationships. That's also where you see a, a, a large, a, pardon me, an, an embezzlement. Uh, a lawyer can embezzle from his clients. An accountant can embezzle, and a stockholder can embezzle by using um, funds that have been entrusted to him for his clients. So that's where you'll see that type of thing. The next one that we're going to go over is receiving stolen property. Number seven is receiving stolen property. There are three elements and at common law, I want you to know that the defendant receives stolen property. He must have the actual knowledge that the property is stolen and the defendant intends to permanently deprive the owner of the property. Again, the three elements for receiving stolen property is number one, defendant actually receives the stolen property. Number two, has actual knowledge that the property is stolen. And number three, he must intend to permanently deprive the owner of that property. Now there is a split here because we have uh, the model penal code, which is the majority and what you want to follow on the MBE. Once again, the model penal code, which is the majority and what you want to follow on the MBE. It's where the defendant sees or stolen property, has actual or constructive knowledge that the property is stolen and he intends to permanently deprive the owner of the property. So one of the classic examples that they give for receiving stolen property under the majority law and what you're going to follow on the MBE is where the guy is out on the street corner selling television sets for 50 bucks. He's selling a thousand dollar television set for 50 bucks. What would you think where would you think that somebody who's selling uh, televisions from on the street corner for 50 bucks got them? Is he really selling property that belongs to him? Probably not, so that would be constructive knowledge. So let's go over that. Again, the defendant receives stolen property with actual or constructive knowledge some type of notice that the property is stolen. Buying a television set for $50, which is valued at $1,000, would probably amount to some type of constructive knowledge that you should know that that property was stolen. And the last one is the de defendant would buy it with the intent to permanently deprive the owner of that property. All right, so that's receiving stolen property. Just to go over those seven crimes against property once more they are number one larceny two continuing trespass doctrine three larceny by trick four false pretense five robbery six embezzlement and seven is receiving stolen property